bringing the pipe? Are you doing the filter fabric? Or are you just bringing the gravel and it's on me? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. And I see I'm like relying on. I'm asking my foundation contractor, are you doing the waterproofing? No, he's not doing the waterproofing, but he's got a sub. And I'm like, okay, am I getting in touch with him? Are you getting in touch with him? He's like, I'll get yeah. in touch with him, but you're paying for it. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. I'm senior editor Patrick McComb. Today, I'm joined by Fine Home Building editorial advisor, Mike Gurton. Hello. Fine, uh, Taunton chief content officer, Rob Yegid. Hey. And our producer, Jeff Rose. Howdy. Please email your questions to fhbpodcast.taunton.com. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. Rob, it is a pleasure to have you on the show today. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah, of course. It's been, uh, it's been a bit. Um, I feel like we're getting the band back together. Am I right? <laughs> it kind of has that vibe. I'm always, I'm always psyched to connect with Mike whenever I can. So when you invited me, I was like, oh, I'm in. Not that I, you know, of course I want to connect with you, Patrick, but I get to talk to you whenever I want. Right. And it is a special uh, time on the podcast. And even more special is we're going to talk about your own project, right, Rob, in the after show? That's that's my understanding. <laughs> so can you just give folks uh, a taste of what you're doing so they know to tune in later? Uh, yeah, sure. I'm um, in the process, in the midst of putting on a rather significant addition to our 1950s cape. Um, that I've already done pretty extensive amount of work to. Um, so we are, let's see, where am I in process? Uh, walls will be poured Monday. Foundation walls will be poured Monday. And so, um, is this been, a two story edition, Rob, or a single yeah, story? Two story. It's a two story. Well, however you want to, it's a Cape. So it'll be matching. There's kind of two actual, It'll look like there are two additions because I'm trying to create this kind of aesthetic as if the house had been added on to kind of multiple times over the course of its history. Um, and so, yeah, the first volume is going to be kind of match the pitch of the existing cape, just going to be set back a little bit. And then there's a much smaller kind of bump out set back from that a little bit, which also kind of follows the contour of the property and the topography. And so, yeah, I mean, I think... It's about 1,100 square feet at the end of the day. Um, and how much, How big is your existing home? Um, 16 or so. Yeah, 15. But yeah. I've also I've also reduced some of the issues, which we'll talk about. Um, you know, just before this call, we were talking about chainsaws, and I was like, oh, Patrick, Patrick must be talking about my demolition, you know, <laughs> that I was doing last weekend, which I'm not. So we reduced some of the existing house to make way for the addition. So there's a little balancing act that's happening. So I think at the end of the day, it's going to be, you know, just under 26 or 2,700 square feet, probably when all is said and done. Well, I so, can't wait to talk more yeah. about that. We'll, we'll talk about the finishes, the choices you've made, uh, the stress of uh, all of this, which I'm sure <laughs> uh, is considerable. Just a bit. Speaking of stress, how you doing, Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. I'm I'm actually not stressed right now, relatively good. speaking. <laughs> Have you been working on your place, doing spring cleanup, planning that kind of stuff? Yeah, mostly just mostly yard work and stuff. Uh, I've been helping Carol carry the seedlings in and out of the house. We had a cold snap uh, overnight a couple nights ago when it got almost to freezing. Uh, probably some parts of the yard actually did get some frost, but. Uh, it's definitely spring. All our trees are leafed out. Uh, you can tell things are uh, happening because uh, my neighbor took down, I think it's 10 trees uh, yesterday, and I've been watching that outside my office window. It's been a bit of a distraction, but I was really struck at the athleticism and physical uh, abilities of climbing arborists. I, that is incredible how um, folks who are good at that work do it, and uh, I have so much respect for that craft. How, how old do you think the guys are on the crew that are that are doing that, walking up the tree, <laughs> climbing up the trees? It's hard to say, Mike, but my guess is he's in his uh, 20s or 30s. Uh, he's definitely been doing it for a while. But obviously, you know, I think that's a career that uh, you can't do forever. Uh, let's just be honest. But it is it is impressive to watch someone who's good at that. Must be 50, 60 feet up in, in some cases. Uh, and this guy's lowering down branches so they don't smash into the asphalt driveway. It's, it's incredible. 
And I've been, uh, uh, pr- you know, my, developing my own strength training. I've been calling it PT, which is painting therapy, uh, <laughs> in an effort to uh, uh, rehabilitate my injured shoulder, which I did uh, a day before my birthday and fell. And uh, it's I've had uh, increasing motion, I think, because of this work. So I, th- I think it's actually helpful. And it occurred this- to me that you could work with physical therapists and invite folks who are in, in uh, you know, shoulder replacement recovery to come over to my house and paint. And I would uh, help them work through their <laughs> r- recovery. There you go. Nice. Uh, are you, uh, uh, is this, is this door painting that you're doing or trim paint? Like, what do you, what do you, uh, what's the project? Oh, good question. So the uh, literal space that uh, surrounds the wood stove in the barn was filthy dirty from wood smoke, right? Uh, it had been 11, 12 years since I had painted it last. Interestingly, uh, great building science exercise. You could see every screw head ghosted uh, into the drywall, and you could see where, you know, the plates were and other framing members uh, in in very distinct. Uh, they call it ghosting, which is dirt. Uh, it's mm. just because those uh, the screws and the framing are colder, so uh, dirt sticks to it better and shows up after a period of years. So I've been painting all that, Rob. Um, there's like kind of this wainscot that I salvaged from uh, the old uh, fine home building building uh, at sixty three at uh, one ninety one that was outside and being used as a ramp to go over the <laughs> curb for the commercial lawnmower. So that's the wainscot I have. That's you know, nice. fi- it's uh, fiber cement, so it's fireproof. Yeah. And I painted that blue to give it a little uh, pizzazz, and I painted the rest of the room. And once I did that, then I wanted to paint my door uh, into my office because it was definitely the grungy po- a part by that point. So, yeah. And you, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you just, you know, having a, a fireplace insert myself, I understand that just they're, you know, what's those inserts? They're just inherently dirty. But you have like a, kind of a rather old, almost vintage, antique wood stove. And I'm just wondering, why is it so dirty? And are you concerned about, kind of, I guess we're going to be talking about, you know, the health impacts of, you know, combustibles later on in the show. But um, is it is it is it because the, are you at all concerned, number one? And number two, are you attributing a lot of this to, like, the fact that you have, essentially, an it's beautiful, but an antique wood stove that may Two not things, be- Rob. It's a relatively airtight building which would have never been the case when this stove was in service in the Victorian era, right? right. Um, and it's not sealed like a modern, uh, you know, good wood stove is, right? It doesn't have, you know, it's, right. it's relatively leak- leaky in comparison. And if we have the right conditions, uh, relatively warm and damp, especially, you get poor draft and I'll get mm. some back puffing if I don't open up a window. Uh, obviously, getting it started uh, makes some smoke even the – most skilled uh, fire builder is going to have a little smoke on occasion making a fire. So, yeah, yeah, it definitely worries me about indoor air quality. I have asthma. You know, I probably should not be breathing wood smoke regularly. So, I'm yeah. considering a uh, monitor style heater, a Renai heater. Uh, sometimes people describe them as a unit heater um, fueled by propane. So, <laughs> once again, <laughs> we're going to talk about that in, <laughs> a little bit later. Mike, what have you been doing? I bet you have new uh, home projects, right? Well, I've found myself the last week repairing outdoor garden tools. I, I just <laughs> every time I turn around, the wheelbarrow has a flat tire, the rake handle's fallen off, the shovel <laughs> handle's broken. You know, the hammer needs a new handle, and so I started in on you know fixing all these tools with you know cobbling together parts from other tools. And then I started realizing that I'm spending an awful lot of time, and I did the math, and I think I made like $4.50 an hour for the amount of time (laughs) that I spent fixing the tools for the cost of buying a new shovel or a new rake or a new wheelbarrow. I could have just thrown them away. And uh, maybe it's a fodder for a future after show, but is it really worth fixing, you know, common, simple, basic tools. You know, power tools are one thing. You might not be up for doing that other than replacing a cord or, you know, a, a blade. But when it comes to these, you know, traditional hand tools, you know, is it worth sharpening a chisel anymore? <laughs> you just buy a new set. I know I spent way too many hours fixing a wheelbarrow one time, but I was also surprised at how expensive they are. Like a good wheelbarrow is what, a couple hundred bucks now or more than that? 
Sure. But yeah. if you're going to spend uh, four hours pulling the tires <laughs> off and then the rusty wheel, you know, and then wire brushing that down and then uh, putting some Rust-Oleum paint on it to get it prepped up and then putting the new wheel, uh, tube and tire on, it's amazing how long these little tasks that seem simple on the face take. And then you add it all up and four hours later, depends on how you value your time, I guess. And I think, you know, like, my, sorry, like I am, I don't know, I have a maybe an overly nostalgic view of like old tools, especially hand me down tools, you know, but not everything that is old is worth preserving. But there are certain instances, like certain shovels and stuff, where I'm like, I don't like the new ones, you know, like these old school true temper kind of things like that are just like feel like they can last hundreds of years you know and like the new stuff that i get at ace is like i don't know they just don't have seemingly they don't have like the the heft and the quality but no i hear well it's interesting you you live in a a a town that made itself famous for uh long handled tools right you want to talk about that yeah edge tools so i live in the town of canton connecticut in uh the village of Collinsville. So Collinsville is a village within Canton, right on the Farmington River. And uh, Collinsville, named after the Collins Company. Um, And Sam Collins, who started this factory way back when, and at one point they were the largest provider of edge tools, um, I believe, in the world. And so if you go downtown, they still have a historic society, which is awesome because they not only made, I mean, they made hammers, they made axes, swords, single bottom plows, and you could see it all there. And so um, at one point, me sitting here in my dining room, you would have been able to hear the factory chugging along down the hill. And so um, it's a really interesting village because you have this factory, which is like many, many factory towns, you know, the factory is kind of like this can't be kind of place at this point lots of artists that that are in there you know there's you know electricians have their you know their kind of shops and there's wood shops and cabinet makers but you know the facilities have been dated you know um but it's still kind of vibrant in that regard but the village itself is really interesting because there's lots of worker houses kind of on this side of the valley and across the river on the other side of the valley which are these kind of single story you know, a uh, multi-family, two-family, essentially very simple houses. And then you have Main Street, which have a range of architectural styles of like the bigger colonials. That must have been the executive, you know, the executive was living there. And so, yeah, I mean, on this property, I have a, a, a fair amount of, of property here. And the things that I find just surface deep, you know, I've found, I don't know how many axe heads, you know. Really? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> axe heads and uh, like machete blanks and... It's it's cool. Um, Machine but, uh, just blank. picks them up. They, <laughs> yeah, when you're, yeah. When you're mowing the lawn, all of a yeah, sudden something yeah. emerges. Yep. Wow. Yeah, and because we are definitely on old farm land here, you know, I have, um, you know, I've got a beautiful. I kind of use it as a bonfire pit now, but a beautiful silo foundation, you know, next to an old remnant of a barn, you know, stone barn foundation, and dotted here and there, and. Yeah, you go into the corners and you're just finding all, all manner of stuff, um, and so yeah, it's a it's a cool spot. Um, I th- you know, Colin. It's no wonder you have a fondness for old tools, right? That's <laughs> like it's yeah, yeah. It makes perfect sense. Yeah, it's not the sole reason why I moved here, Patrick, but it is uh, definitely a perk. Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> my passion doesn't run that deep to like you know, completely you know, move my family to a town that you know has a history of making cool tools. <laughs> but no, check it it's, out. It strikes me as odd that you just like find this stuff on the ground. That's you know, but of course you do. Yeah, some of it is obviously not with preserving, but I've got a few axe heads that I you know, of all the projects, <laughs> might like one day I might try to you know restore them and, and clean them up, but. You can still see some of the, you know, the Cal- the Collins, you know, stamp in the in the head of it. So it's cool. Well, we got some great feedback from our listeners, as we always do, and I always want to uh, say how much I appreciate you all writing in with your questions and uh, comments on the shows. But uh, this one comes from Eric. Hey, thanks for your recent podcast, finally talking about some of the possibilities and complications to induction cooking, based on a number of YouTube videos and some searching online for other independent reviewers. 
such as Consumer Reports. I bought a portable induction cooktop. It was only $116, but similar models can be found for less than $100. I was surprised to learn that the whole cooking with gas bit was 1930s propaganda. The environmental slash climate cha change channel Climate Town did a great job of talking about the history of gas advertising. Did you guys happen to watch this YouTube video? The uh, ad campaigns, the marketing campaigns of the gas industry comes up are just completely bonkers. They are just off the deep end. I don't know what's going on, but I'll link this uh, in the show notes so you all can take a look at this stuff, but it is crazy. Uh, the video that finally, finally made me switch was a comparison by the excellent YouTube channel Technology Connections. Um, there's a, I'll put a link for that one too. This video is over an hour long, but it has some excellent demonstrations with actual measurements of air quality and speed. America's Tet's Kitchen uh, recommended Duck's Top uh, and not the super expensive model either. I was very surprised when I first used it, how cool it was to cook with. Now I realize that was because the previous gas and electric resistance stove I've used heat up much of the air around the pan as much as the pan itself. The induction heats only the pan. What do you think, Rob? How do you cook? I cook, I cook on an electric range. Um, it's kind of funny. You had you know, mentioned kind of like this propaganda machine funded by the... <laughs> Gas industry, like, of, I don't know, I don't know when you dated to the night, uh, you know, what era, but that, it's it's not over. Uh, it, my uh, my immediate reaction is like, of course, the, the the cultural moment of like this potential gas ban, you know, that kind of got out of control. But I remember seeing uh, reports that, you know, obviously there's lots of stakeholders at play, but uh, they were funding influencer marketing campaigns um, with prominent chefs talking about the probably the same thing, like the value and the quality of only cooking with gas. And so like, it's not, it's not over Patrick. <laughs> the video that Eric sent, I watched it before the show. So I didn't watch the whole thing, but, um, the, the, the part I found most interesting is, you know, so cooking is the only really tangible, uh, thing people have with their fuel, right? Uh, if your furnace works, most people don't even want to think about it, right? They don't want to think about what powers it. They it just like, they just want it to be warm and comfortable, but gas, uh, cooking is is different and the interesting thing to me was that only three percent of the gas sold in the u.s goes to cooking whereas almost 70 percent goes to space heating and then the other percentage it goes to making hot water so the gas folks are smart enough to realize that if they want to influence public opinion they got to go after uh cooking right they get to, people are coming to take your gas range which i thought was pretty interesting yeah yeah i will say i mean i'm not i mean i'm Considering we'll get into the after show when it comes to appliances like induction, I'm not like super stoked about my electric range, but it is what it is, and we're surviving just fine. I feel the same <laughs> way, and you know, honestly, I've been considering making a switch to propane, which is you know, arguably even uh, worse for the planet. Uh, and folks are gonna probably have some feedback on that, but uh, you know, there's something really. Uh, appealing to me about the simplicity and uh, expense of gas heating appliances compared to heat pumps. Like, I worry that if my heat pump breaks, I'm not going to find someone to fix it, uh, especially if you're talking about the, you know, variable capacity, uh, high tech stuff. That's, um, we don't have enough HVAC techs. Well, you're best off to find the tech now or at least <laughs> find the company, right? You know, even, you know, with, with traditional, um, fossil fuel based heating systems, people are, you know, should, whether it's gas or oil or should have some tech come in every year or two years to do a cleaning and check the whole system out. But a lot of people don't do that with their air conditioning or their heat pump systems. And then they wait till something breaks. Whereas I've gotten in the habit of finding a tech or company to come out and, you know, at least every couple of years, just go through my system just to make sure everything's, you know, the charge is, uh, is correct. Uh, and if they see any parts that are wearing or maybe just cleaning the bird's nest out of the, or the mouse nest out of the, the outdoor unit. Um, and that way I've got a connection so that when there is a problem, they know my system, they can come out and they can fix it. So don't and wait you're a repeat customer, minute. not some just random dude, right? That's, that's exactly. also a part you're of it. You're not yeah. just a one-off. You're a regular client. And they treat you a little bit better. That's good advice. Very good advice. Um, 
This comes from Jerry. Hey, podcasters. I love the podcast. Look forward to it every week and love that the midweek pro talks are coming out regularly too. I have a few thoughts to share on some topics you've covered recently. First, I have a book recommendation for people interested in carbon accounting. How Bad Are Bananas by Mike Berners-Lee, which talks about the carbon cost of different things like text messages, pouring a glass of water, or writing an email, which all have less than 10 grams as of 2011. It's weird to think of me that there's a carbon cost to sending a text, right? It's like, how's that yeah. work? Sure. <laughs> Some home building related pages are uh, one kilogram of concrete, which registers somewhere around 100 grams of carbon, one kilogram of steel, which is much higher. There are definitely principles we can apply to reduce carbon in our buildings, like buying local, not wasting things, using wood and not concrete, and avoiding plastic and glue. All easier said than done. I would bet that the Simpsons ties, nails, and glue in any given project outweigh the lumber in terms of carbon. I liked hearing Preston's comments about batteries. At the company I work for, we employ 8 to 10 carpenters fully kitted out with DeWalt tools. Over the past three years or so, we've switched the bulk of them from corded to cordless. One snag was a 23-gauge pin nailer. For a while, the only one on the market was made by Ryobi. We had a couple floating around at the company, but it meant carrying a charger and battery for one tool, which is a pain. Ryobi also makes a battery hot glue gun that one carpenter liked. We used the adapter that Preston mentioned to run one uh, with a DeWalt battery converter. DeWalt has, has a pinner now, so we've adopted that. Uh, there are some off-brand Amazon sellers that have hot glue guns made for each battery platform, so we've gotten DeWalt versions for some of our carpenters. The rechargeable AA and AAA battery packs are perfect for lasers, probably also moisture meters and other small tools. Well, couldn't agree more with that either. One thing I uh, learned in the news the other day was uh, a trade worker, I believe it was in Maine, had their... Um, cordless tool batteries in the back of their pickup truck and it caught fire and it was a mind-blowing event because there was nothing left of that truck after uh, it had caught fire it was just a shell wow i don't know what happened if it was an off-brand battery or if somebody like you know uh put it in a place where the contacts could get shorted or whatever but it was dramatic yeah the whole battery conversation is you know, I know that the the front end of the reader's comment was about kind of our not necessarily carbon neutrality, but you know, carbon impact, and then this pivot to you know battery technology and quote unquote renewables. And uh, Green Building Advisor recently, within the past two weeks, published a pretty both horrific and compelling and important article from their partner at the Yale Environmental uh, Group. They kind of do partner posts around the. Uh, uh, kind of supply chain and the humanitarian aspect of cobalt mining and mineral oh, mining. that was and, horrible. <laughs> and it was like, it, it, it was sobering because you do, and I agree, you know, like, you know, under the presumptions of progress and lessening our impact, sometimes I feel like, are we just moving the chess pieces around the board and we're not really advancing because, um, because of those impacts of, you know, especially in the Congo or these kind of cobalt or these the mineral hotspots. And, <laughs> and what is our kind of, um, how does our experience and our consumption actually relate to the lives of those who are deeper into the supply chain, completely out of our view and perspective? Um, it's worth, it's worth reading and just considering, I don't have a great point of view on it because I can't wrap my heads around the complete issue it just comes up again. It's like, ah, you know, EVs and, you know, cordless everything. It's like, there's still, there's still a very significant impact. Like, you know, we can't wash our hands of it all. So child anyway. slave labor seems like something we should oh not goodness. be supporting. You know what I mean? It's, it's yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and again, you know, like average consumers or even not even, even knowledgeable consumers, you know, like this awareness of how deep into the supply chain are they, are, are do we have insights? And often we don't, you know, um, and so it's, and, and I understand, especially our readers are always trying to make the most informed choices possible, you know, with the least impact. And so it just, I don't know, it, it behooves us to, to look deeply. And I think sometimes when we consider electrification and batteries and renewables, it feels like, oh, we're good. We don't have to look because this is, this is, this is the, this is the uh, solution. Right. And we kind of just, I don't know, clip off, you know, we have got blinders on, I think, on, on some fronts. So anyway, not to go down the rabbit hole. There, there are no simple <laughs> answers to these problems, yeah. right? It's, yeah. yeah. 
Uh, Richard wrote in, uh, almost all houses in the South and West, uh, you guys could use a phone a friend like Matt Reisinger during the podcast, especially around Southern issues like uh, these and HVAC. The only reason the South is as populated is. So Richard sent a link to a Matt Reisinger video talking about what is a good uh, attic for uh, HVAC systems. And the conversation we were having was with Samantha in her existing house. So I don't know if it's exactly parallel, but it's like, what do you do? to improve a house with an air handler and ductwork in the attic if you can't afford to like do a deep energy retrofit and you know i think there's some question as to the logic of deep energy retrofits anyway right now so it's i think it's more complicated than just saying do this do this do this just like you were saying about batteries rob hmm. uh well, our first question comes from ethan hello fine home building podcast i can't tell you how many jobs i've been on when it comes down to the question, who installs the bath fan tubing and exterior vent? It's not the electrician. It's beneath the HVAC guy. It's not the plumber. It's not the carpenter. Should it be general conditions for the GC if, if you're lucky? I'd like to get this sorted out before my next job gets underway. Thanks, Ethan. So who's putting your bath fan in, Rob? That's a good question. <laughs> uh, when I... When I uh, when I finished our upstairs and had to put a bath fan in, I, I, I did it, you know, um, but you're right. I mean, Mike, you, you know, in a more professional, broader context, you know, like when you're dealing with many trades, I don't know. I don't, I don't have a, I don't have a great answer. There's no um, great answer. No. Yeah. And when, when I read this, it immediately got me thinking of all of the other little tasks or maybe even my major tasks that kind of fall through the cracks where there's no specific trade contractor, or if there is a specific trade contractor to do the task, the work that needs to be done is time specific where it's not in sequence with that particular trade contractor coming. And, and, I, and I wrote Patrick a note and said, here's a whole list of things. We should do this as an after show because there are so many things, whether you're a homeowner tackling a project or a contractor and maybe more so on the contractor side of how do you figure it out and then maybe query our our listeners because maybe they have solutions for all these but often it falls on the shoulders of the contractor and if the contractor has you know one or two people working for them on staff that ends up being the people who do these little chores more or less I I'm guessing that's... it's so often a punch list item, right? Because it's nobody's job. <laughs> and, and that's why it's done so half-baked so often, you know, with uh, coils of vent tube or, you know, having the outlet just be pushed out a soffit vent, for example. How many times have you guys seen that? Or just like right. having it kind of up near the ridge or maybe not even vented at all, uh, yeah, just kind of lying up there in the attic. And there's no expertise that's developed because these are one-off little things, little projects, little parts of the job. I couldn't help but be thinking about our listener, Nicole, who was asking, you know, like, how do you keep craft alive during soul bashing work when she was up in her <laughs> attic trying to deal with her sucky uh, bath fan or not sucky yeah. bath fan? I think that's, and we'll get into the after show, I'm sure, but that's something that, number one, Mike, I think I agree. I think that is absolutely worth a list diving into because me – serving as GC, I am constantly assessing who is doing what. Like I'm talking to my excavator right now and I'm trying to assess like, you know, cause he's going to come back soon to do, you know, footing drains. And I was like, are you bringing the pipe? Are you doing the filter fabric? Or are you just bringing the gravel and it's on me? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and I see I'm like relying up, asking my foundation contract, are you doing the waterproofing? No, he's not doing the waterproofing, but he's got a sub <laughs> and I'm like, okay, am I getting in touch with him? Are you getting in touch with him? He's like, I'll get yeah. in touch with him, but you're paying for it. But you're, you'll, you'll pay him directly. And it's like, so yeah, understanding the roadmap, like the roadmap, and I, I'm sure it's different. And like, I'm relying on the subs to give me feedback, but at least I, at least I'm asking the, at least I'm asking the question. So I don't. I was going to say that. you're you're way ahead of the game because you yeah. know like what what questions to ask. Yeah. So I'm not hitting dead ends. So I'm not arriving on the job and being like. Oh yeah, progress is stopping while I figure this out <laughs> now that I'm at this. Th yeah, right. But yeah, I think Mike, you're right. And then also, again, the other qualifying factor is like and what you guys are scratching at is like, okay, who is doing what and how often do they do it and how are they going to do it and is that in the is that the way that I want it to be done? You that's know, that's the other half of it. Yeah, and that's yeah, that gets crazy. So I 
I mean, I'll tune into that next show when you guys uh, when you guys dig into that because I think it's I think it's helpful for everybody. Whether it's a homeowner acting as your GC GCs or or people on the on the trade side, um, I think it'd be a definitely a helpful discussion for sure. So here's here's a, here's a little clue I use to decide this stuff is like who sells the equipment. So I think, in generally speaking, it's electrical wholesalers who sell bath fans, right? So it makes me think it's the electrician, but the the. A supply, electrical supply house doesn't sell the duct work, so the, the electrician doesn't hook up the duct work, and the HVAC supplier doesn't sell the, the, the roof cap. That's at the roofing supply house, so like it tells me that all these folks should be involved in this process, but that's just not yeah. how it works. And, and, the, and then you've got the interface between each of the different trades and what who's going to be responsible for what. I mean, you get – I mean, bring it down to a basic step flashing between a roof and a wall. Okay, is that the side or is a roofer? Depends on who comes first, who's supplying it, who's installing it, and who's going to check it to make sure it was done right. Oh. Yeah. And there's a, there's yeah. a lot of responsibility that ends up on the general contractors, the builders' shoulders that yeah. they really <laughs> should be on top of it. But this is a a big, deep discussion that <laughs> we could save for What do you time. think? I mean, I think the bath fan is the perfect example of this it kind is. of job. That's no one's work. Uh, what it else yeah. do you think is on that list, guys? You mentioned like attic plenums, but that's kind of weird, right? So you're talking about well, putting uh, HVAC equipment in a, in a special truss that yep. needs an air barrier, mm -hmm. so, but that has to be done before all the other drywall, right? Because the, so yeah, that, that's, well, that's a kind of weird one. Rob brought up another really good one, both foundation waterproofing and or damp proofing and the choice between them and who's going to do that. And then uh, footing drains, you know, who, who I mean, off, you think it's going to be the excavator, but a lot of excavators don't don't do that. They run machines. They don't get out of the machine. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, they don't. <laughs> I was joking. Like I was joking. I talked to my father last night. And I was joking. My excavator is also like a family friend. And he's really talented. Like he's a really talented excavator. But I was laughing. I was like, I don't think he has a shovel on the truck. Like, <laughs> he's got gas in his machine. And that's what he's got. If you, you have know? a shovel on the truck, you might have to use it, right? If yeah, you, you just don't have it, out. you're like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I hear you. Yep. You know, I was planning uh, uh, one of my rental houses. I was putting in a new septic system. So I had the excavator doing the septic system. I had the plumber doing what he does. But we all forgot about who's going to core drill through the foundation to get that pipe out. It's like, oh, well, yeah. that was me. No. Yeah. <laughs> what, when, it, when, the, when the answer is it's no one's job, it's always the GC's job, right? That's, yeah. that's, the, that's the final answer. Yeah. So there you go, Rob. <laughs> oh, I know. Oh. I know it. Yeah. I was cutting seven o'clock yesterday morning. I was cutting the sewer pipe from our house so that, you know, our, my foundation contractor could get his forms in, you know, yeah. We should tell folks briefly what you're dealing with. So that was a very heavy cast iron line that was kind of propped up on two by fours while you were doing the excavation where it, it, presumably it ran. It, it was dodgy. <laughs> it was actually a kind of a concrete clay pipe. Mm. There was a, a smorgasbord of uh, <laughs> pipes in there. But yeah, I had this thing, you know, propped up like through the excavation, just propped up. And then my foundation contractor, you know, was like, what are you going to do? And like, what are we going to do about this? And fortunately, my plumber was responsive. He was able to swing by one afternoon. He's like, I would sleeve the footing. You know, this way I could kind of come back. I could get it done and we don't have to worry about the walls. They could kind of rock and roll. Unfortunately, there were delays and, you know, it didn't all work out perfectly. So, yeah, so I had to, yeah, I had to, you know, get my family kind of squared away and out of the house and seven o'clock yeah, in pipe. the morning, start sawing <laughs> pipe, got it out of the way. Foundation contractor showed up at 7.30, like he said he would, and he's like, can I set my forms? I'm like, go for it, you know? Fortunately, the plumber was able to come back four hours later and reroute it and, you know, right through the footing. I had I, I also, because the excavator didn't d dig back the sewer line, I had a hand dig for... Oh. For the more, connection to uh, it. Yeah. More hours that it, to, to get the connection and to ensure that, because I'm at the footing level now, also to ensure I'm digging for far enough away that I at least have some level of pitch, which means I had to go farther and farther away from uh, the footing. And so fortunately I had, I was thinking ahead. I was like, okay, let me excavate beneath this pipe. Let me be sure that I'm, I'm 
over excavating just so that he has a pitch and he doesn't come back and be like, sorry, you know, I can't, I can't, I can't do make this, this right? That's the, yeah. You know? yeah. So I was able to get that squared away and was able to let my wife know, texted her. I was like, plumber's here. By the time you're home, everything is going to be fine. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> but yeah, just like all like, like, and we'll get into that later, but like the sequencing of everything and you're right. Like the GC, I think just has to be, the gap filler and tasks that need to get done or when trays aren't available or there's gaps in order, if they want to keep things kind of on pace and on schedule, be willing to kind of just step in and kind of do the work that needs to be done in order to keep trades going really, you know? So yeah, it's a, uh, it's an interesting. How do you cut uh, that clay pipe? I use a carbide tipped, um, recip saw blade. Um, <laughs> It was the same blade that I used to cut the, because I've got a uh, hydronic, you know, I had kind of cast yeah. iron. I've got hydronic, you know, heating radiators and stuff. <laughs> so a couple of weeks ago during lunch, I cut my heating system <laughs> apart. <laughs> <laughs> and that, you know, that carbide tip blade, you know, went through like, you know, rather easily. And I was like, okay, you know what? I think it could handle this concrete, you know, clay pipe. And it, it, and it did. Um, Those things are amazing, right? That is a fantastic are, yeah. product. Yeah. Yeah, because I was I was entertaining. I was like, am I going to get a you know am I going to get a grinder with a diamond you know cutoff wheel you know? And I was like, um, let me just give this a shot. And it was it was totally fine. That's cool. Well, yeah. there you go, folks. That's worth the price of admission to the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jerry writes in, I have a design question for y'all. We're studying a sunroom and I'd love to hear your take on finished material choices. The deck will be a PT frame with Azek decking. There will be knee walls with hardy siding on the exterior with AZEC trim to match the house. It will have screens above the half wall and cedar wrap posts and beams. I'm worried that the cedar wrap posts and beams will look funny paired with the hardy siding and white AZEC trim on the exterior. I'm attaching a pic of the, re- of the rendering our architect did. Thanks for everything you do. Um, so Jerry's got a very handsome uh, sunroom here. I think you guys would agree. Yeah, kind of an sure. intersecting gable off the back of his uh, what looks like you know, step down colonial house. And, uh, what do you think? Cedar okay. trim with white cedar or with white Azek? Just to clarify, Patrick, he's wondering whether his pergola should be, I'm looking at the rendering, right. And I'm looking at the sunroom that obviously is trimmed out with white, presumably, um, Azek or something kind of similar. And then he seems to have cedar wrapped, a cedar wrapped pergola adjacent to that. Is that what we're talking about? I think so. Yeah. And I'm thinking okay. about the screen between the screens and stuff too, because I'm guessing that those are PT, uh, posts that are framing a large part of that sunroom. So, okay. Uh, I think it's going to look great. Yeah. And yeah, this the is going to turn time. white anyway. <laughs> mm-hmm. This is, this is done all the time. You know, you put a pergola on the house. The only difference here that from what I usually see is the way the reverse gable uh, addition for that sunroom, it comes off like, so it makes like a little inside corner and the pergola sits, you know, one side against the sunroom, one side against the main house, but the cedar will look fine. Yeah, I agree. Um, we never agree on everything in totality, so that's got to be the right answer. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I definitely hone my focus on the pergola itself, rather, you know, because the rendering shows kind of like the sunroom details all kind of consistent. And my immediate question was like, okay, you know, you kind of get into like your own maintenance, you know, threshold, I think, and keeping it naturally cedar, like cool, like if you want it to be looking fresh. And then I started getting into it's like, okay, you're going to have wisteria growing on this at some point, And that should kind of inform your factor. But if not, if it's going to be completely accessible, then like, and you're not, you know, opposed to the weathering of cedar and the graying and the obvious, you know, at some point graying out. Cool. Um, but I think that would weigh like what aesthetically, what do you want it to look like? But in the rendering, I think it looks, it looks totally fine. Uh, totally fine. I, I, yeah. I think it's going to look fantastic. And um, yeah. I, like Rob said, if if you do anything to that pergola, it's going to be a maintenance nightmare because presumably you want stuff to grow on it, right? And that's, you know, Perhaps. you're never going <laughs> to. <laughs> right. You know, the nice thing with mixing some natural wood with the painted surfaces, it just gives you contrast to define the spaces. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, that's frequently why it's done. So it's it's not, not unusual, very common. Yeah. Oh boy, I can't wait to get to this next question. Hey, podcast crew, I was sent this study last week. What do you guys make of this? 
And uh, this is a study from Napoleon Fireplaces, and uh, I'll briefly uh, read some of the highlights of this. Um, Napoleon, a leading manufacturer of gas, electric, and wood fireplaces, partnered with the University of Illinois and the University of Alabama to study the health impacts of fire on our lives. There is a common sentiment that firelight is relaxing and that relaxed people are healthier. Napoleon set out to explore what the true impacts of fire are on wellness. The first study, which took place during the fall of 2022 at the University of Alabama, tested whether an electric fireplace could induce physical relaxation. To establish an electric fireplace that is an effective tool for relaxation, 226 unassuming adults were asked to spend 15 minutes in two different rooms. The rooms were exactly the same with one exception, an electric fireplace. Participants wore a simple heart rate monitor and pre and post test blood pressures were compared. The study found statistically significant de decreases in both heart rate and blood pressure in the room with a fireplace. The results indicate that a fireplace could be used as an effective in-home amenity to combat feelings of stress, which can lead to enhanced well-being and improved health. I got to get one of these things. What do you guys think? Uh, change your life. Yeah. <laughs> the second study, which occurred in the fall of 2022 at the University of Illinois, tested whether an electric fireplace could support well-being by creating environments that bolster enrichment, seeking an adults aged 50 or older. Enrichment seeking is the process of seeking new information, skills, and insights. Those who seek out and engage in novel, intellectually challenging, or complex socially activities tend to also maintain higher cognitive and socio-emotional well-being as they age. Therefore, enrichment seeking is important for health and well-being. It must be nurtured. Okay. 60 adults played a game in high-pressure, no-pressure conditions with and without a fireplace. Participants in the room with a fireplace saw a 12% improvement in cognitive ability as measured by game performance and their adaptivity to enrichment seeking increased, increased. The results provide evidence that adding a fireplace to home environment nurtures curiosity and openness to new ideas, thereby supporting health and well-being of people as they age. Oh my goodness. So I found it very interesting that they tested electron, electric fireplaces uh, versus gas or wood-burning fireplaces, which doesn't seem like a fair comparison to start at all. Right. It's, uh, it's suspicious, uh, a bit. <laughs> <laughs> to, say, to say the least, um, you know, I wonder, and of course, you know, the, you know, the findings have been interpreted and communicated to us from Napoleon themselves. And so and it's I'm a very small study too. Very it's a very small, small study. It's just, <laughs> you know, it's like, okay. It's, okay. It's a bit of a stretch, I think. Like, and I, I wonder if under further scrutiny or if we saw the bigger picture in the full report, if like, you know, the scientific nature and findings of this would just be blown to smithereens. Um, <laughs> well, indoor but, air quality is something they're not examining. And I think that's going to have a huge impact on your health. If this thing is, uh, yeah. you know, either ventless or uh, wood burning. Uh, but it's, it's electric. They only tested electric. Yeah, they only tested yeah. electric. So it doesn't seem fair. Right. Well. Is that surprising I, I, to you that people pay for studies like this? Like, what do you think they paid these respective universities to 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 do this research? And and well, I'm going to sidestep that question for a second <laughs> because when I was in graduate school, I remember one of my professors was doing research for it was and it was funded by a company, and he said. I can pretty much prove whatever you want <laughs> by just the way we set the, the, the test parameters up. You can almost direct it. And, and he wasn't saying that's what he was doing in the instance he was doing, but he said, if your client is a company and you're doing research, they're really unhappy when you come up with, with a result that shows <laughs> that is counter to right. what they want to claim. So, it kind of leads you to guess where. I find that so troubling, though, because scientists are supposed to be above that. They're supposed to be doing science. They're supposed to be well, doing research, not sure. making up results for a client. But they also need funding. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Patrick. Well, for those of you who are interested, I will put this uh, study on the podcast page for your own amusement. Um, 
<laughs> so, so would would we agree that there's there's the likelihood of an electric fireplace having the effect of improving your uh, performance on playing a game would be uh, would be kind of null wouldn't wouldn't really have much of an effect on playing a game in high pressure. I'd, I'd agree <laughs> with that. I think there was a twelve percent uh, performance increase, which is like eh. okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's a roll of a dice a couple of times exactly you know? yeah right yeah? especially if you only play the game once <laughs> i know i think i gotta get an electric fireplace uh in here to improve my cognitive function and productivity for my work that's going to be right. the secret to my uh ongoing uh, uh i don't know productivity. honestly i get back to my nostalgic roots i guess like when i see an electric fireplace i just kind of get sad a little bit <laughs> You know, I'm just like, that is, there's nothing all that authentic or real about that. That is a, a, a cartoon version of a fireplace. <laughs> or we at had least a, that conversation on a recent podcast and that's oh, I feel really? the same way. Yeah. yeah I feel the same it could way. be one, one step better than the television, the, the large flash yeah, yeah. television, just playing a right, revolving yeah. loop of a fire in the background. I feel like you may as well just do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's less expensive. <laughs> uh, this is a long one, folks, so bear with me. This is Patrick, and it's worth uh, reading his entire email because he is a complete uh, hardcore DIYer. Uh, he is deep, deep, deep into it. <laughs> Um, Patrick here from Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, Canada. I'm a longtime magazine subscriber and podcast listener of Fine Home Building and more recently GBA while working on a very significant renovation of our 1942 built one and a half story classic Dartmouth home, which we purchased in 2015. A classic Dartmouth home is one that sits on a hill with no driveway access to the home or yard. A short parking spot is typically below at street level with stairs up to the yard for access. This can make renovation work far more challenging. I'm not a tradesperson by training, but I was extremely fortunate to grow up immersed in construction and renovation work and learn from my father and his best friend of many years along the way. Now a few decades and several properties later, I'm confident enough to go online, do my research, and tackle some very sizable design and build projects that would have likely been very intimidating to the average homeowner. Fine Home Building's archives have been an incredible resource during my many projects, and I'm always thankful for the little nuggets I get from the podcast. Since buying our current home, I've knocked off a few large projects so far, including a large deck teardown and redesign, a complete bathroom renovation, and during the height of COVID, I took down a structural wall to combine two upstairs rooms together into a larger master bedroom. Although most of these projects tended to drag on to the realities of my life, my wife hasn't divorced me yet. Count your blessings, Patrick. <laughs> All of these projects pale in comparison to what I've gotten myself into this time around. As you'll see from the attached photos, I've taken on an ominous project of digging down my own basement. The basement stood at just barely six feet, and the plan was for a full seven foot six inches by the time I'm done. Interestingly, the idea to dig down and use an interior retrofit footing came from Fine Home Building issue, 9, in issue 95 Q&A's retrofit footing and sat in my brain for six years before I decided to take action. Last year, while in another COVID lockdown, I decided that the pain of the dig would be worth it to capture the 350 square feet of usable space that was only being used for storage and barely workable laundry. So I contacted a structural engineer to have a look at my plan. During the site visit, it was determined that a version of the same L-shaped footing from issue 95 would be the best option. My existing 1942 home had no footing under the concrete walls near the center support columns or chimney. The floor was essentially scrap concrete and in some instances no more than an inch thick with no reinforcement. There was a great deal of moisture during the spring and summer requiring a dehumidifier, but no visible running water intrusion. These issues, combined with the height of the space, convinced me that I should go for it. So with stamp drawings in hands, I decided to grab the sledgehammer and get to work. I've been steady at this in my spare time for just over 15 months now with some fairly significant breaks along the way to enjoy summer, take family vacations, deal with a few sports-related injuries, and handle surges of busy work life. All of the excavation has been done by hand and without heavy equipment using a sledge, 
hammer drill, shovel, pick, and five-gallon buckets to remove the soil, carry it up the stairs, across the yard, down the front stairs to the dumpster below. I've been called crazy for doing this, but the challenges of yard access and related destruction of walkways and gardens to get a piece of machinery into the basement made it the only palatable choice. Excavation has been done using the standard five-foot dig and four-foot form and pour approach. Because such little concrete is used at a time, bags of premixed concrete mixed and poured by hand also made the most financial sense. As you can see from my photos, I'm very nearly finished. All of the footings and excavation of the entire center area is complete. By the numbers, I have moved 55 yards of soil and rock out and carried 386 bags of concrete in. With only about two yards of concrete left to go, the end is near. As I wrap up this stage of my job, I'm now turning my attention to the inevitable infill of gravel, floor, concrete pour, and insulation. To prep for this, I'm extremely interested in your opinions on my plan, insulation, and water control details. I've attached two sketches with some explanation and was wondering if you might be able to comment on what you see, best practices, and any considerations I may have missed, as well as these questions. I'm planning to run interior drainage board as a curtain down all the exterior walls and under the floor to preemptively control any water penetration. Given the number of cold joints in the concrete, I think this is the best, most reliable solution than a painted on membrane. What main membrane? What are your thoughts? Yes, do that. Yep. <laughs> Definitely do that. The reason not to is it's going to cost more, but if, if, you, if you got the money, do that. It's definitely better. I'm planning to use XPS foam on the walls, including down between the walls and floor and under the floor. First, is XPS the right solution or should I use EPS? Under the floor, if I use XPS or EPS, do I also need a vapor barrier? I see a lot of conflicting information on this front, but my current understanding is that it would not be required. I think you should. What do you guys think? I think you should put a vapor retarder down, vapor barrier. And EPS is fine too if you can get it. It's harder to get than XPS oftentimes. And you should yeah. probably get like 25 PSI, right? Or 20 PSI. Yeah, Steve Basic had once said that he he uses the kind of vapor barrier. I mean, I, I guess a, a different kind of context because he's not going to have a, you know, a concrete truck, you know, doing a pour here. But he had experience actually what he called, you know, uh, sheets of foam on, under a slab, like iceberging, you know? Um, they float, right? Yeah, they float. They're yeah. getting underneath that. And so like the vapor barrier on top, you know, does not, you know, kind of prevents that in his experience beyond the added kind of, moisture control and vapor control yeah that's, and the you know sheets are going to be two by eight right or four by eight so there's going to be a ton of seams and if you know you don't cover that with plastic you're going to get some vapor drive through that seams admittedly not as much but some right and 350 square foot you know we're not talking a, a, a really great expense and it's not hard to do right we're not they're not talking anything really complicated yeah uh, when it comes to finishing the insulation and sealing around the first floor connection, I have the added challenge of embedded joists, full on one side of the house, partial on the other. How can I ensure to get my joists the best chance at longevity while still providing the best insulation and humidity control? Um, so I'm guessing in order to make the, I don't know, the house lower to the ground or just it was a detail, they have some kind of step in the foundation with the, the and floors uh, joist uh, into the foundation wall. So well, that's not ideal. Curious. Well, yeah. That's what I was. I was curious if they were captured floor joists on a shelf, as you had mentioned. But he had said embedded, um, which my mind goes to a different <laughs> kind of mm. assembly. And like then I kind of you know then my mind goes to you know, capillary breaks and things. You know what what can you do? You know it's it's not about like oh I'll just insulate the quote unquote rim with closed cell and handle the moisture from the environment. We're talking about moisture wicking into those joists from the foundation itself and i don't know mike i mean how, <laughs> well it's been it's been there since what the 40s yeah, so yeah it, 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 it just don't change anything <laughs> and <laughs> right? they can dry it, you know working. they can dry yeah. on the, yeah. the you know they're going to move from more to less so the when mm -hmm. the wet end the end is going to be wet and but the, it's going to gradually dry toward the interior so well there okay, is some drying. So there is some drying until if he is kind of insulating right and if he goes and if he changes that dynamic, is he now creating a condition and preventing that drying that has allowed those ends to dry? You know what I mean? I don't, I, I don't know. But it devils in the details on, on how he's yeah. going to where he's insulating. But it sounds like he's insulating under the slab, so he's probably going to insulate the walls. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so best off if you don't put a ceiling on those joists and let them dry to the interior, as long as you're controlling the moisture inside that now uh, basement yeah. area, as long as the humidity levels inside there are maintained at a low enough level, you'll continue the drying of those joists. Hopefully. It might be a good idea, Patrick, to buy a moisture meter uh, yeah. if you can swing a pin one. You know, just just check it out for a while and see what's going on. You might have to run your uh, dehumidifier still seasonally just to yep. give that more drying potential. Yep. Yeah. And it's a chance to buy a new tool, Patrick, which seems like right up your alley. <laughs> um, bonus question: Before I pour the floor, should I rough in for future radon control? And Mike is yep. nodding. Cheap, uh, cheap and easy. Right. It just uh, yeah, you don't even need to. You know, some people will put a whole bed of stone down. All you really need is uh, just enough of a recess into the native soil to put a little bit of stone down to allow the air to flow into your perforated pipe. And you don't have to run it continuous all the way around, just one pipe down the middle or one along the side, and then just at least get a, a pipe, a vertical pipe coming up. Then uh, if you do and cap it inside the basement. Then if you do notice that there's some rate elevated radon, then you can pop out the side of the building and then up the wall on the outside to get either natural ventilation of that radon or put an active fan on it. So. Mike, you had mentioned it because I was, you know, again, personal question kind of, but obviously Patrick's in the same boat. I would recently looked and I wasn't sure, you know, the amount of pipe and where it's placed. And I wasn't sure if there was either a best practice or a code provision in terms of figuring that out. Or do you just say, well, I'm going to run the length of pipe straight down. The, and that's kind of good it, enough. Is it one pipe, two pipes? You know, like, I, I was just, I was yeah, curious. There's, yeah. There's, there's no, uh, there's nothing when we're doing new houses that I know of that gives us any in, you know, uh, like guidelines on, on what to put. Um, yeah. I've always placed either uh, well-drained gravel or more likely a crushed stone layer before I pour the slab. And then one piece of pipe down the middle, figuring that the stone is going to allow any radon gases or any soil gases to move laterally. Then when you right. put negative pressure, either due to the stack effect of the pipe or with an active fan, it's going to be drawn to that perforated pipe and then evacuated yeah. out. I think here, since Patrick is already going to be planning, what well, we just recommended putting a vapor barrier, that probably is going to resolve most of your radon problems. As long as you seal that plastic up against your existing concrete walls, that's going to help a lot in reducing the amount of radon that gets in there. And then, you know, even a short piece of pipe. Uh, when we do retrofits on radon systems, sometimes we just dig a little hole in there, right? Drill, drill, yeah, we just break out a hole, maybe two feet by two feet, dig down a little bit in the middle of the slab, put some crushed stone, and then just draw from that little well of air under the slab. So, and, and often just that little bit of depressurization is enough to uh, evacuate the radon rather than it seeking the any uh, holes into the uh, basement through the edges of the slab. Uh, I just want to say, Patrick, you are an amazing worker. <laughs> I would love to hang out with you. And yes, uh, I would totally carry out some mud buckets of your dirt to help you out. So Yeah, I applaud him. <laughs> and it's like, it is also one of those projects that is perfect for like, you know, it's extreme, right? Obviously, and he's like committed to it. But it's like one of those perfect remodeling projects because he could walk up those stairs, shut the door and take a break as he and, he and he doesn't have to live really in like a construction zone. And like, that is huge, right? Like when you have like when you are in like he wouldn't be able to do that with the kitchen, for instance, no. or something that was like like part of his his, his or his family's day to day routine where they're stepping over the tools. And so like, yeah, people might think you're crazy, but like I think number one, I applaud you. But also it's like is like that perfect long term. You're going to chisel away at this work, you know, as your time and budget allows. Like it's it's a perfect dynamic in that situation, I think. And so what an excellent segue to your own uh, endless toil <laughs> we're going to discuss in the after show. Yeah, yeah, for sure. How uh, many five-gallon five <laughs> buckets is 55 cubic yards? How many five-gallon <laughs> buckets? I mean, he's, he's got all the metrics here of what he, you know, the number of bags of concrete moved in. I can get that. But I know what 55 cubic yards 
of, of Phil looks like when it comes off of a 20 ton dump truck, that's like, you know, three trucks full, mm. but how many <laughs> five gallon buckets <laughs> would it take to fill a 20 ton dump truck? Oh my goodness. What do the neighbors think? Right, the neighbors got to be like, <laughs> they think what's he's going like, on over there in the basement? <laughs> they think he's like making a great escape, right? They're like he's right. tunneling out of the property. I know. Yeah. Oh man. <clears throat> it looks I've great too. Work. The quality of work is really good, Patrick. You're doing a freaking yeah, nice does. job. It looks besides, tidy. yeah, yeah, yeah. We have great folks that listen to this show, and all of you, thank you very much for listening. Uh, Unfortunately, that is all the time we have today. Thanks to Rob and Mike and Jeff for joining me, and thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Keep craft alive. Thanks very much for listening. Happy building.